Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College Online Journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. Make sure not to miss a single podcast and subscribe to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast at iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite subscription service. The views expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of the U.S. Army War College, U.S. Army, or Department of Defense. Welcome to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast. I'm Ron Granary, professor of history at the Department of National Security and Strategy at the U.S. Army War College and podcast editor of The War Room. It's a pleasure to have you with us. For 50 years, the Eisenhower Series College program has been the U.S. Army War College's communication and outreach program designed to encourage dialogue on national security and other policy issues between War College students and the broader public. In pursuit of that dialogue, War College students have traveled across the country speaking to college classes, voluntary organizations, think tanks, and other public forums. In our age of corona and social distancing, however, the Eisenhower program has unfortunately had to scale back student travels. Here at A Better Peace, we aim to pick up the slack by giving students in the program a chance to share their expertise and insights with you and to encourage your response to them. Today's podcast is the third in an intended series of such episodes. Today's topic is new weapons and domains. Our guests today are three members of the U.S. Army War College Class of 2020. Colonel Ryan Erler is an Army Special Forces officer with over 22 years of operational experience, who's commanded a joint task force to defeat ISIS in Syria and Libya, and was involved in several hostage rescue operations in the Middle East and Africa. He is a graduate of the University of Michigan with a degree in civil and environmental engineering, as well as a master's from the Naval War College. Lieutenant Colonel Henry Schantz is an Air Force command pilot with over 2,300 total flight hours in fighter aircraft. He was the commander of the 525 Fighter Squadron, one of five operational F-22 squadrons. He is a graduate of the Air Force Academy and holds an MS and an MBA. Lieutenant Colonel Dave Short is an air defense officer who, while serving with U.S. Strategic Command, managed the anti-ballistic missile system and the integration with space-based systems. His research project at the U.S. Army War College includes senior leader misconduct and the effects of willpower on decision-making. Welcome to A Better Peace, gentlemen. Thanks. Thanks, Ron. So first, uh, normally in the Eisenhower program, uh, people give a brief talk. Uh, We're going to keep the talks especially brief today, but I want to give each of the three participants a chance to say what their talk would have been about on this topic of new domains and weapons. And so, Ryan, I will start with you. Thanks, Ron, and thank you for the warm introduction. Uh, My discussion is more focused on providing soldiers the tools uh, to innovate and improve performance. Uh, We found that this saves money and increases retention as well as improves the performance of the organization. The mechanisms we look to provide allow the soldiers to capture ideas, rapidly prototype them, and iterate those ideas with feedback from the field. The way we do that is threefold provide expertise, giving them individuals with the training and skills for computer-aided design, engineering, programming, and fabrication. The second piece is giving them the actual tools, the computer-aided design tools, to capture those ideas before they fleet uh, and escape the soldiers in the field. The tools to conduct additive and subtractive or traditional manufacturing, both through 3D printers, CNC machines, uh, etc., all of the tools that they would need to create, create those prototypes in the field. And then third, and most importantly, instilling a command climate of support for those ideas, the ability to fund ideas kind of along the way that small scale venture capital firms are able to incentivize their employees to come up with new tools and techniques and procedures. The integration with industry and with local universities is key to this. Having relationships near the bases so that soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines can reach out to people with this expertise and help rehearse it and improve their skills will allow them to take the ideas that come to them in the heat of battle and quickly turn them into solutions. We've seen numerous examples from World War II to the present where that has happened. Many, many labs exist in the DOD from the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency or DARPA to the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, DITRA, 
through Johns Hopkins, Applied Physics Laboratory, etc. But having soldiers literate in those design tools and that design methodology allows us to better capture ideas in the field and rapidly put them into, into use. Thanks, Ron. Great. Thank you, Ryan. Henry, how about your project? Yeah, good morning, Ron. Thanks for, morning. Uh, for having us here. Um, my project overall uh, that I've been spending time on this year has been autonomous weapons and uh, uh, how they have an issue of trust. And by that, I mean uh, looking at specifically autonomous weapon systems that are capable of employing without man actually hitting the, uh, the pickle button. According to Department of Defense, we look at the human supervised autonomous weapon systems, which effectively go ahead and put out that these systems are intended to only engage um, with the ability to intervene and terminate. Uh, so they're actually going out there making decisions, going through that process and using that artificial intelligence to really press forward. So as we look at that, uh, really, what can we as a society uh, really put forward to go ahead and um, look on and how we're going to trust that. A, a couple things come to mind as you look at that. Uh, first of all, uh, the results uh, of whatever action it takes have to be acceptable to us. Uh, they need to fall within our you know, national interest, uh, the ideas and the values that we hold uh, dear. So uh, we have to take a look at that. We also need to look at whether or not they conform to the conduct that we normally, uh, that we actually hold all of our uh, military to. Um, and that's really falls under like just war theory and making sure that uh, we're really adhering to that high level of, uh, of conduct. Other things that we uh, need to look at or really need to, to understand are what happens if we do accept the autonomous weapon systems, they go out and there's an unacceptable consequence or an unacceptable outcome. Uh, are we willing to go ahead uh, and move forward with that? And then it's not even just the unacceptable outcome from the weapon system, but also as we remove ourselves from that reality of war, uh, whether or not we uh, become a little bit more uh, calloused or maybe not as involved in that uh, human uh, nature portion of, uh, of war. Uh, so we have to look at the accountability of that and we have to look at uh, what levels those accountabilities are held. My specific research paper uh, went into more on how um, military members, once we do get this technology, um, how we go ahead and trust this technology as we use it. Um, but we really need to have a national debate. We really need to to look forward uh, for the next 10 years because within the next 10 years, we are going to field autonomous weapon systems. Great. Thanks, Henry. And Dave. Thanks, Ron. Yeah. So uh, for space, uh, normally I uh, break this uh, domain down in the development of new uh, weapons, especially the offensive and war fighting part with uh, breaking it down into uh, the past, the present, and the future. Mm -hmm. And so um, space really... Um, not necessarily a, a new domain. Um, the, you know, the U S has been operating in space, uh, for decades. Um, usually we tend to think of that as, uh, with the launch of Sputnik and, uh, the space race and, uh, um, manned space flight, but, um, really it goes all the way back to world war two, um, with the first launch of the V2 rocket from Nazi Germany into Paris in, in 1944. Um, and really, uh, humankind's, uh, interaction with space, um, started um, with crossing the barrier into the space uh, with warfare um, and in an offensive nature. And so um, that, that's the, the origins of it. And then, of course, as the Cold War and arms control treaties came into place uh, um, in the space race, uh, eventually we got to the point where uh, space became this peaceful exploration and uh, maintaining free and open access to it with uh, things like the Outer Space Treaty. And then we get to the, the present day where um, that that domain that existed in that competitive space and that environment has changed just a bit where it's become competitive. Uh, there's certain characteristics of, of space that are, that are harsh and, uh, um, to the, you know, greatest degrees, um, of, of uh, on the spectrum. And then it's, it's contested, uh, between, uh, other folks that are operating in space. Um, and it's, uh, you know, from, 2015 was a big year with both uh, Russia and China consolidating some some of their forces uh, to conduct offensive and war fighting capabilities in space. And then it's congested. There's a lot of folks now, not just on a uh, necessarily competitor adversarial standpoint, but there's a lot of 
a lot of objects operating in space now from anywhere from 24,000 objects and 1,800 satellites operated across uh, more than uh, two dozen uh, nations and entities uh, across the globe. And so it's a very congested environment and together with those characteristics makes uh, space definitely a, a unique environment. But where's the future of it going? Well, you see the Space Force and U.S. Space Command and the establishment of those organizations are really just uh, here going into the future is uh, a reaction to um, in meeting um, our other competitors out there and what they've done, but uh, making sure that there's a warfighting arm in space that can um, both deter and defend uh, and defeat, if necessary, um, those assets that we have, as well as the uh, free and open access to the to a global common. And uh, mm -hmm. you see that with the development of things like uh, directed energy weapons, um, electronic warfare capabilities, and uh, countering uh, anti-satellite technology or ASAT uh, technology. And so that's really the the, the big pieces of the initial development of uh, operations in space. So right. thanks. Thank you, Dave. So I'm listening to the three of you and talk about your, your uh, projects and your interests, right? As I, I see we're, we're, we're talking around overlapping issues, right? Ryan is talking about how we develop new uh, technologies. Uh, Henry is talking about what sorts of technologies we would develop. Um, and Dave, you're talking about where we would end up uh, applying some of these newest technologies. And so this is where we get to this, this overlap between new domains and new tools to operate in those domains. And I want to ask each of you, when you think about the challenges of new domains and new technologies, what kind of uh, historical parallels can you think of, of older, older weapon systems that um, have offered the kind of game-changing qualities that, that we talk about today when we talk about the, the kinds of, of g -whiz technologies of uh, energy weapons or hypersonics or uh, are there, do we have anything that we can think of that did similar, that forced similar rethinking of strategy um, that we uh, seem to be facing today. And I want to start with, uh, I want to start with you, Henry. Yeah, Ron. Um, when I talk, think about challenges and the question you just asked about new domains and how that uh, game changing when you talk about um, artificial intelligence, uh, the weapons that uh, primarily we're looking at are uh, an extension of things that we've had in the past. Mm -hmm. I think about historically, uh, what type of large change would have gone from a, maybe a way that we conducted war to a new way of conducting war? You know, and I think of uh, every time we add in something like, you know, gunpowder to um, now more of a bombing tactic and the idea of using airplanes specifically from an Air Force perspective to go ahead and, and provide um, that that lethal capability and using something that uh, just accelerated or moved that uh, weapon a little bit farther forward or used in a different way. We talk about nuclear weapons when, um, of course, they came on board. They changed a lot of the thought process on, you know, how we even – uh, created a force structure for our military and how we were going to employ. Uh, but as we look towards um, the artificially intelligent weapons, um, some of the, the bigger things there are that we're allowing them to make decisions, right? And that's mm. where the trust of this um, this comes in. in. In the past, all these weapons were tools that we used, but as we go ahead and start to use artificial intelligence, they're creating um, decision matrices that um, have been out there, but they should all be learning systems. So they're developing and they're adapting. Um, and as we press forward, what we do is we, you know, inculcate them with what our values are and the thoughts and the ideas that we can put in there and then uh, continually refine and monitor to make sure that those decisions and those, um, the, those actions that they're taking are actually um, reflecting what our values are. And I think that that's what concerns most people. So mm -hmm. the step forward is more, you know, do the weapons in the past uh, reflect uh, what we believe on, you know, maybe how much destruction they do or the way that they do their destruction. Whereas I think in the future, the bigger thing is um, those weapons might actually have an ability to do something that we either do or do not want them to do, which is where which is where that trust comes in. I can see what you mean there, because I was thinking of this from the Air Force perspective, is with the development of uh, missile technology, that led a lot of pilots to worry that here now you have a, a weapon that once you launch it, you can't change it. But at least there was still the idea that it was a decision to launch. Whereas if we go to a complete, if we, we have AI and autonomous weapons, then even the launch decision is taken out of the hands of a commander. Yeah, very, very true. And I mean, specifically, when you talk about 
uh, launching weapons, uh, you know, in an air to air and air to ground mentality, you know, as soon as you get all the way through your decision process, you know, you hit the button and that weapon is going to do what you ask it to do. And, um, just to, to reiterate what you said now, you're allowing the weapon to, to make some of those decisions where you're kind of ultimately responsible for what that weapon does, even though you might not be fully in on the decision that it makes. And right. so it's just a little bit different. Gotcha. Well, and, and Ryan, we were talking about when we talk about new weapons and I'm, I'm interested, you know, Henry was discussing how there's the possibility that you develop a new weapon that is beyond the decision making capability of or beyond the decision of the commander. And yet uh, what I what what I hear you saying in your description of the idea of involving the warfighter in the development of the technology is that perhaps then the 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 potential uses and the capabilities could be developed alongside input from the people who are likely to use it in the future. Is that fair to say what you're, what you're interested in there? It, it is Ron. Yeah. And I think it's, it's interesting that I would follow Henry in this case, because you're talking about, you know, someone who is flying the most advanced aircraft in the world right. uh, to now someone who continues to go to the fight in the old fashioned way, wearing boots that I'm sure are much more advanced than the Brogans of the civil war era. <laughs> but still, despite the best insoles and the most durable outs- uh, outer material, you know, it still requires men and women to put 100 pounds of lightweight combat equipment on their back and, and mm-hmm. get to the fight. Uh, by, so I think by the way, the phrase know, 100 pounds and lightweight combat equipment, that's a that that, that in itself talks, uh, is, is something that would make a civilian stop and think. But go right ahead. The, be- the beauty of radical battery technology, the lightest batteries in the world allows you to carry more of them. <laughs> um, and so the weight never changes. It's only just with the capability, which is great. And so I think, so Ron, you know, to, to your point, you're, you know, the first question you asked about, you know, the, the thing that strikes me from the, from the ground perspective, or at least from the, the, the soldier perspective is the radical leveling effect of much of technology nowadays. The fact that tech formerly only in the hands of first world nation states is now available to almost anybody. Mm. And so a little bit in, you know, contrary to, or not in, in, the difference between what Henry's talking about with you know this advanced you know, artificial intelligence and control of the air, uh, on the flip side, on the ground, we have seen you know very recently in Iraq and Syria is the use of commercial off-the-shelf technology changed to suit a military necessity, i.e., drones used for observation and attack. We had American forces who were under attack from the air because of small you know, Chinese-made DJI phantom drones that had been retrofitted to drop 40 millimeter grenades uh, in the hands of the Islamic State, who were able to then fly under the cover, even with the world's greatest aircraft above, when these drones are flying 30 to 50 feet off the ground, very difficult to detect. Mm. And they could fly over, find forces and attack, and withdraw all underneath the umbrella of the most advanced defense systems in the world. And so you know, that, the fact that that is in the hands of violent extremist organizations and in lesser advanced nation states. Similarly, uh, CRISPR technology, where you can do gene splicing now for the, in the tens of thousands of dollars versus in the millions of dollars previously, where now a threat country or a threat organization can produce a biological or a chemical threat that is outside of our ability to defend ourselves or our ability to respond. And you know, really, this is just reflective of the pace of change being so rapid. Uh, the reason I'm interested in the topic is because we have folks on the ground that, that are seeing this and are, are thinking, why don't we just do X, Y, or Z to counter this? And getting that idea from the battlefield where that soldier is thinking about it because they are the ones receiving that 40 millimeter hand grenade from the sky, right. getting that back into the hands of someone who can fix it back in the States or elsewhere in the world uh, rapidly is 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 absolutely critical. And I've seen some incredible examples of this. We were dealing with a, a situation in the city of Raqqa where they had tarps covering the streets and they were able to drive these vehicle-borne improvised explosive devices out of the city and attack formations very quickly because we couldn't see through those, those tarps covering the streets. So some soldiers came up with an idea of why don't we send a helicopter over the top of it and find a way to tear down these, these tarps, which is exactly what they did. We, we were able to get them some money get them some ideas. Two soldiers who happen to be avid model helicopter pilots linked up with some people with the technology and the, and the, the know-how to develop these procedures. And we essentially turned small agricultural helicopters into, uh, or small agricultural remote control helicopters into a tool to tear these tarps down so we could see the, the VBIEDs or those vehicle-borne improvised right. explosive devices before they reached their attack point. 
So simple solutions that were facilitated by soldiers on the ground recognizing the need and then supported by the people with the know-how to make it make it work. Interesting. So it's keeping open those lines of communication between the practitioner and the theor- and the theorist and the uh, and the technician to make sure that there's a, a a constant loop of information so that people know what they need to try to figure out what to do. Absolutely. Something better than simply an email back to someone in a lab who mm-hmm. can then come up with an exquisite solution that will cost many millions of dollars <laughs> and will be available three days after the war is over. Right. Well, and which, and when we talk about the size and scale and expense, Dave, this is what makes me think about the the problems of how we envision dealing with space. There's a there's a paradox that as a, a as a civilian that I, I think about is that we uh, space force and uh, and space command, um, and even going back to the the initial development of NASA, right? These were originally uh, developments associated with the Air Force, and yet. If there's a domain that is most like outer space, right? It's not the sky; it's underwater, right? Because we're talking about a place where you know you you need to do an awful lot just to keep people alive if you're going to put people up there or to develop technology. And I always think about this when we talk about the development of space technology: is um, in what ways are the in what ways do all of the armed services provide their expertise in thinking about how to fight in the space domain? Yeah, so I th- I think uh, the corollary with underwater is a good one, right? Because mm-hmm. it's aside from the the ocean also being a global common, we tend to think of the surface there. But um, certainly, space as it's characterized is a lot more like the underwater as far as the extremes, right? Mm-hmm. From one extreme to the other, and uh, the environment of space is. Um, just that w- one extreme to the other, right? Hundreds of degrees above freezing at times uh, versus um, below freezing with subatomic particles um, that can uh, uh, affect assets that are in space mm-hmm. um, to just the sheer speed. Um, folks don't take into account the, the, you know, when you're on orbit going 17,000 miles per hour, you see an astronaut floating in space in the movies and you tend to think, you know, they're just up there floating, but they're, they're going around the earth. I, I think it's about nine times. I mean, that, that right. it's such a, it's so fast. Um, it's almost, you, you can't even conceive how fast it actually is. Um, you see movies like uh, gravity and mm-hmm. they see the debris coming when you're on orbit you would never even, it's so fast, you would never see the debris coming. It oh, just, is that right? It would, because it would, it would at, be coming at you at thousands of miles an hour. Se- yeah, 17,000 miles per hour. Mm-hmm. I mean, it would be coming at you uh, that quickly. Um, so um, it is literally faster. I mean, not just faster than a speeding bullet, but exponentially, you know, you know, uh, many times faster than a speeding bullet. So um, that, 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 that's kind of how harsh it is. And so when you look at the services and how they, you know, how they approach it, um, I, I think that's why, you know, the space force is needed um, mm-hmm. with things like the U.S. Space Command and the warfighting end to the man, train and equip uh, with the services um, to be able to develop, you know, as Ryan was just talking about exquisite technologies. Well, that that's exactly, you know, space is because of those harsh extremes requires those uh, exquisite technology uh, to be able to operate in that environment, even be it in this era. Uh, the barrier has been lowered uh, to the point where there's other folks operating in the environment as well as the commercialization of space happening. Um, so um, that that's where the services uh, just, you know, would not be able to to compete in this environment because the it's just changed. It is mm-hmm. not the same environment that it was decades ago. Um, and it, it is competitive. Uh, it is contested. And it's congested. And the, your original question, I think Henry brought up about, you know, the you know, the nuclear age and, and how that changed strategy and, and mm-hmm. theory. Um, I, I had mentioned, you know, the V2 with, with the development of rockets and then missile technology. And then you go into the nuclear age with intercontinental ballistic missiles. Um, all, all of that is game changing. And folks have, you know, said, you know, there's there's folks who've made the argument about space with how congested it is. And I think it was a uh, former um, the former chairman, uh, Dunford, General Dunford had said, you know, that, um, you know, in space, uh, with considering warfare that nobody wins, Hmm. um, because the, the, the moment you start, you know, with at least on orbit, if you just think of low earth orbit and, uh, you know, 24,000 objects and 1800 satellites, that's going to exponentially grow. The predictions are about 20,000 here in the the next few years with micro satellites is that, um, you start doing anti-satellites, 
you know, with anti-satellite technology and weapons that uh, it, it can, you know, at those speeds that I mentioned can be absolutely catastrophic. Right. And um, no, no, nobody's going to win in that scenario. So it's folks have harkened to like the, you know, mutually assured destruction of, you know, theory of uh, the Cold War and uh, nuclear warfare or, you know, mutually, uh, mutually vulnerable uh, in this case, right? That, um, that you've got to be able to have that credible deterrent uh, to prevent folks from uh, or deter them from uh, taking these type of actions. And that's exactly what the development of, of these weapons right now are, are focused on. Right. Well, and I would say that's, this is part of a, of a larger question for, for the three of you. And that is that one of the you know, critics of critics of the military generally note that it is easier for, uh, for the, for the services, easier for the military to cite the need for more new stuff to deal with new challenges than it is to decide which old stuff is no longer necessary. Um, and in a world of increasingly constrained resources, how do each of you think the military should set priorities when dealing with brand new challenges, brand new weapons, brand new domains, right? Is it just we, we always need more, more, more? Or is there a sense that we can figure out how we can develop new things while also recognizing that we can scale down other activities? And I realize this is a, a big hornet's nest, but I figure we could talk about this in the last 10 minutes or so that are available to us. And so I was going to start with you, Henry. All right. Yeah. So as we talk about uh, new technologies and priorities, um, you know, looking at what we've done in the past, I will be honest, you know, as an Air Force officer, the Air Force is normally uh, chided as uh, a service that looks towards the technologies uh, in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Um as we continue to uh, press forward and we've seen, you know, the advent of aviation over the past hundred years and what it's changed to. And as, you know, Dave has been talking about um, the step into space that uh, up until this point, the air force has kind of been uh, revolving in or has been a, a part of, um, you know, those things, they continually press forward. The technology changes at such a rate that it's very easy to go, well, we got something new, let's go for it. Um, and it gets more and more expensive. Uh, the hard part is, you know, as we continue to see the applications for some of these technologies, you have to look at, you know, what do we expect the world to be in the next 10 to 15 years? Uh, for most of our acquisition programs, we're trying to shorten those time frames, uh, but the acquisition programs right now are 10 to 15 years to get a system online that has the full capability. And during that time frame, it's changed probably 15 to 20 times based on the way the technology changes. So when you look at how do we set these priorities, uh, I think it's a very hard thing to look at because when you go, hey, what are we going to need in 15 years? Um, the, the world is going to be a completely different place. But I think that we need to continue to at least uh, invest in these technologies so that we can go ahead and look at maybe other applications uh, that we can get. And that'll be joint and across the force. Uh, it's not specifically toward aviation, you know, autonomous wingmen, but it could be the ideas of how we utilize some of the um, some of the technologies that are developed during that. So the, the deeper AI um the ways that we can apply that to logistics or we can apply that to uh, possibly operations in space, um, how we're able to really look at those, I think, need to continue to be invested in. The biggest thing, though, is that we need to continue to invest jointly and not try to do these stovepiped in specific service function um, or service oriented functions. So uh, when it comes down to it, I, I think that we need to invest in technology, but not specifically to the detriment of, uh, of what we're doing right now. I gotcha. And, and Dave, what do you think about this? The, especially since space force and space command, these are the newest guys to come online to, uh, to have budget priorities and, and, uh, uh, and requests. How do we under, how do we set priorities when dealing with something as brand new and as potentially infinite as space? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's a, it's a good question. I think you obviously got to look for where you can get uh, synergy um, and, you know, with the, the development of new capabilities in, in Space Force, what properly belongs in that, that arena. Um, and I think uh, where you can divest of, of older technology, I, I think the way ahead, though, primarily is with dual use capability. Mm -hmm. um, those systems, uh, and I would, I, as an example, would, you know, um, you 
you know, munitions and missiles that can do both offensive and defensive capability or one that exists now, you know, that can do both conventional and nuclear. Um, when we look at areas and arenas like that, um, when it comes to space um, in the missile defense arena, you've got the Missile Defense Agency developing uh, space, potentially space-based interceptors for missile defense. Um, that certainly has an overlap uh, with the space domain, even though not inherently belonging to either the Space Force um, or U.S. Space Command. But I think the future, when you have to prioritize without talking which specific program to divest and invest in, I think the big one is uh, making sure that it's, um, as mentioned, uh, joint in nature. I would also say multi-domain. Mm -hmm. And that um, dual use capability, I think, is really going to be the future where, um, and, and I would give one example of that is um, you've got Aegis Ashore uh, in Eastern Europe that, um, the Russians have complained about, uh, even though it's purely a defensive stance and has defensive interceptors for missile defense, but does potentially have the capability where you can put an offensive capability very quickly and uh, transition it. Um, I think systems like that, especially when you start talking about the space domain that um, can have uh, dual capability in what they provide is really where you're going to get the most bang for the buck uh, going forward. All right. Well, and this is good because this allows me then to come around to you, Ryan, since part of your discussion was about the idea of dual use or mixed use or, or a special and also communication, say, between the uh, military and the civilian worlds in order to develop the proper technologies. Um, how do we imagine, I've, uh, you use the examples, that you, you talked about DARPA, and of course, when I think of dual use technology, I think of the internet, uh, which we're using right now to facilitate this conversation. Um, how can we develop appropriate partnerships that will uh, that will allow not only to set priorities, but also to have both the military and the civilian sectors understand each other's priorities better. Yeah, Ron, I think that's the, the tough question right there is, you know, how do you get that tug of war between, you know, the most advanced technology and then that technology, which will probably be used today, but won't help us in a future fight. Mm. Um, and I think you, you mean you nailed it right there. I, my, my, my response back to this, because really, I think Henry and Dave you know, really touched on the importance of the joint development and the dual use, et cetera. But really the importance of partnership and relationships at this point, because all of the problems that we face in the world, if we try to face them alone, it will be absolutely cost prohibitive. But if we can maintain that, that infrastructure or that um, collection of partnerships out there that give us people with the proper tools to deal with some of our, you know, less complex problems and then we can focus on developing really solutions to this you know the severely uh, challenging problems such as space and stealth etc you know then maybe we can we can integrate the two and and find a way to come to a solution together because frankly there's no way we can develop aircraft like the f-22 that will suit the needs of a counterinsurgency fight and be a uh, you know a, a number a, the, the leading uh, aircraft for a near peer environment. Hmm. It's just the flight profile is impossible to support that, let alone the technology to do it. And so how do we, we can't keep A-10s, F-22s, and every other aircraft that we need flying at exactly the same time under the current budget constraints. But what we can do is we can train allies and partners to do some of those missions on our behalf, or maybe we can institute some cheaper technologies such as you know single engine propeller driven aircraft going back to the 1950s and the 1940s with that integrated technology bolted onto it that allows us to do some of those, you know, kinetic but not near peer type fights so that we can continue to fund the the large projects going forward. Interesting. Well, and I, I will say that this 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 does bring us back to the larger issue that we all need to think about, and that is maintaining that sense of cooperation, communication, uh, and, and collaboration that is necessary for the future of the force. It's also necessary for the future of budget priorities and the future of the development of the U.S. government. And of course, one of the basic principles behind the Eisenhower program is to encourage communication between the military and civilian sectors. And I want to thank the three of you. Ryan Erler, Henry Schantz, and Dave Short for joining us today on A Better Peace to uh, push forward that communication between the military and civilian worlds. Thanks very much for joining us today, guys. Thanks for having us, Ron. Thanks very much, Ron. Thanks, Ron.
Thank you. And thanks to all of you for listening in. Please send us your comments on this program and all other programs and send us your suggestions for future programs. We're always happy to hear from you here on A Better Peace. But until next time, from the War Room, I'm Ron Granary. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.